For those who are watching, and we know that sometimes these programs are recorded and played later on a tape, let me just give you the context for what I'm going to say. Uh, the date right now is January 3rd, 4th, 2020. A week ago, uh, there were two violent events that took place, one Saturday night, one Sunday, um, one in a Hanukkah celebration, a knifing in a church in Texas, a shooting, and sadly these are not the first times this has happened. And that's the, part of the reason for what I admit is a provocative title for today's message, Weapons in the Church. And I'm not just using it as a title, I will actually address that, but that's not the real central focus. The focus is going to be on the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. But uh, I do have some amazing facts about the church and weapons. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that during World War I, 44% of the bells in the churches in Germany were confiscated by the military to melt down and turn into weapons of war. Doesn't that sound sad? Something that was designed for wedding bells and worship turned into weapons that could be used to bomb churches. And then of course we know uh, last week uh, we saw the, the terrible news about the shooting at the West Freeway Church of Christ. I think I was especially troubled by this because I lived in Texas, lived near Fort Worth. Believe it or not, I used to attend the Church of Christ and they even paid me from time to time to preach there. They only paid me $10 a sermon, so I'll let you decide what that means. But, um, so I, I felt like I knew these people. It talks about how they had just, one of the men who was shot had just finished distributing communion because I know in the Church of Christ, they do communion every week. And, um, and so I was acquainted with them, their doctrines, the people, lovely people, and just heart sickening when you see something like that happen. And then, you know, it, it especially uh, became notable on the news because several of the members were also armed. They say there were 25 people in the congregation that day that were armed. Only two or three responded that uh, the news reported on. And it makes you wonder what the world is coming to. You know, there's a quote from the book Maranatha. If you don't have that beautiful devotion about the last days, I recommend it. It's still in print. It was one of the best. In Maranatha, page 175, the signs of the times give evidence that the judgments of, the, of heaven are being poured out and that the day of the Lord is at hand. Daily the papers are full of indications of an intense conflict in the future. Thefts and murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed by demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. All these things testify that the Lord's coming is near. So when we hear and see these things filling the news, God is not surprised by this. Uh, it's just evidence for the signs of the times. The coming of the Lord is near and as the Spirit of God is being withdrawn and at some point those angels in Revelation are going to release the four corners of the earth. They're holding back the winds of strife and, and there'll be a time of trouble such, you, you have, such as you have never seen before. And so I think we're just seeing the, the lightning on the horizon right now in just what's happening. Now I, I don't believe we're supposed to live in fear. I don't. And uh, you know you see this this concern even in in religious gatherings people are worried about security. I remember it's almost two years ago we were in Israel and on Sabbath we went to the Wailing Wall which was you know the site next to the sacred temple mount and it was sort of a strange paradox because on one end you'd see 
all of these very joyful worshipers. You know, the men are arm in arm and they're dancing in the circles and they're singing and there were evangelicals singing and praying and praising the Lord and the lady were on the other side of this barrier and they were gathered together and singing and we stood back at a distance and we watched this. But mingling all through the crowd, there was very obvious heavy Israeli police security, heavily armed soldiers and police, flak jacks, guns, equipment, I don't even know what they had under their Kevlar there. They're holding their rifles, fingers just above the trigger. And so there was this palpable tension even in the midst of the worship that was going on. And it's not just there in Jerusalem, I'm quite certain if you go to the Vatican that they got the Swiss Guard. And there's a military presence. So it shouldn't surprise you that you know, I had a few people emailed this week and they said, Pastor Doug, is it ever wrong to have weapons in the church? Well, my opinion is worth about a nickel. What matters is what does the Bible say? Amen? What about armed security in a church? Personally, I don't see that there's any moral dilemma there based on my Bible study. Um, Whenever you've got a group of people together, it's sometimes practical to have precautions in case of an emergency. Do you realize that we've got fire extinguishers in the building? I hope we never have to use them. But it's probably smart to have them. And uh, you may not know we've got a defibrillator on the premises here because if some of you should have a heart attack, we'll, we'll run and we can take this equipment and zap you and we hope we never have to use that. But it's a smart safety precaution. How many of you agree? And in the same way, living in a world where you've got a lot of people and you know that there's a possibility that you might need some strong security, uh, I don't think there is a moral dilemma to having people, having security, even armed security at religious gatherings. Now what does the Bible say about this? Uh, oddly, when David was running from Saul and he needed a weapon, guess where he went? The church. Now I'm not suggesting we turn this into an arsenal, but I just think that that's something worthy of mention. He picked up the sword of Goliath that was wrapped up behind, and you can read about this, 1 Samuel 21. I always want to give you the verse. 1 Samuel 21, 9. So the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, who you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will, take it. And David said, there's none like it. The Bible tells us when Jehoiada, the high priest, was about to um, coronate young King Joash, that uh, he had temple guards that were armed in the temple and they were told to use their arms if necessary. Second Chronicles 23 verse 7. And the Levites shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand. And whoever comes into the house, let him be put to death. And this is verse 9, Jehoiada the priest gave to the captains of hundreds the spears and the large and small shields which had belonged to David that were in the temple of God. Now you got weapons in the church. And he said, all the people, every man with his weapon in his hand from right to left of the temple to the left side of the temple along the altar, this is clearly in the courtyard, and by the temple all around the king. Now of course granted this was a time where there was a security risk. Athaliah was on the throne. She had killed all of the royal seed. They needed additional security stepped up. So you, you're practical. Now Jehoiada was a very spiritual, faith-filled man. He lived 130 years, longer than Moses. But he realized, uh, I'm not just going to be trusting the Lord. We're going to get the soldiers. And because of the additional risk, they're going to be prepared. And so I think it's important to be wise. Now there is also one case where the weapon was used in the church and God forbid that should ever happen. Uh, but it does happen. When Solomon became king, it was following an attempted coup of Adonijah, Joab, and Abiathar the high priest. And Joab fled to the temple got a hold of the horns of the altar. He knew that uh, there was judgment coming. Now David had told Solomon, uh, Joab's been a scoundrel. Don't let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. He killed two men in premeditated murder. He killed uh, Abner and he killed Amasa. He acted like he wanted to shake hands and give him a hug and he stabbed him under the fifth rib. I mean Joab was a, a rough character. And uh, 
But Joab thought, well, I'll go to the temple. You know, when you're playing hide and seek, you grab a hold of home and you're safe. And they thought this will be sanctuary. In some cases, that was allowed. There were cities of refuge. Jerusalem was one of, it was the seventh of six other city of refuge. And so Joab went and he got a hold of the horns of the altar. Solomon said, go slay him. He's guilty of murder and, and uh, treason. And Benaniah told Joab, the king says, come on out of the temple. Joab says, I'm not moving. This is a paraphrase. Benaniah went back to Solomon and said, I can't get him to leave. Solomon said, slay him there. Now Solomon was doing that based on a verse in Exodus 21. Moses said, if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you will take him from my altar that he may die. That's exactly what happened to Joab. He was slain there in the house of the Lord. Now I'm just giving you a little background so you'll know what the Bible perspective was. Justice and protection does not stop happening once you enter the church. It's still a place, uh, a domain of common sense. And so where there's times of increased danger, then you might need increased security. And uh, let me just tell you that I trust in the Lord. We're secure here. I've got faith in God. But we also take practical measures here that uh, we don't advertise. Let's just call it don't ask, don't tell. But uh, I, I do think that we need to trust the Lord. Now, I don't want anyone living in fear. Uh, the real, there is a real weapon. There is a real threat for churches and Christians in the world today. Um, I'm not worried so much about a, a shooting. I don't want to tempt the Lord, but, you know, I've, I've never really worried about that just because I figure that um, God watches over us. But according to Christianity Today, there are approximately 385,000 congregations in North America. Got 330 million people. When you got that many people and that many congregations, that's not counting all of the synagogues and mosques. There are approximately one and a half shootings a year since 1999. Statistically, you're probably pretty safe. But I mean, anything could happen. I don't want to, like I said, tempt the Lord. But uh, I'm not worried about that. What I am worried about is another weapon that's in the church every week. It's the devil. You read in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16. Above all taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The devil is sending out fiery darts and flaming arrows all the time. Are you protected against that? That is the most important thing. Do you have the shield of faith? Ephesians 6 verse 12. Uh, you know this is not the kind of adversary that we can wrestle to the ground and disarm. Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There is a very real threat because the devil brings weapons to church. Not only does he tempt us here, he brings weapons to our homes. And he's firing darts and he is doing all he can to injure um, God's people at all times. So, I think I've already made it clear there's nothing wrong with defending yourselves. I think Christians in our relationships, we should love each other and turn the other cheek as often as possible. But that's not a civil law. Civil law is eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Uh, if someone invaded your home, I would hope if someone was using force that you would do all you could to protect your family. That's to me, I think, common sense. Protestant leaders believe that. But uh, what about when an enemy is invading you spiritually? Now, I don't think we should trust into any earthly weapons. Our trust should be in the Lord. Amen? You know, let me give you a couple of verses on that. Luke 22, verse 36 Jesus made a statement here. He says, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. He's talking about, you know, now we've reached the end. And likewise a knapsack. And he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And Jesus said, if you sell your garment and buy a sword. So the disciples said, Lord, look, we have two swords. And Jesus said, it is enough. And people have taken this verse. It's been very confusing. They think, Jesus said two swords is enough, sell your garment, buy a sword. That, that must be, you know, we should probably pawn something and buy a gun. Is that what he's saying? 
to protect ourselves? No, this is so misunderstood. Jesus is speaking in spiritual terms when he says, sell your garment and buy a sword. What is Christ talking about when he talks about the sword? He said, I came not to send peace but a sword. It's the word that he's talking about. And so when he said, sell your garment and buy one, they said, Lord, we've got two swords. He said, it is enough. Was Jesus saying you're going to overcome the Roman army with two swords? No. The word there, it is enough, translates enough of this. You don't get it. It's the word, oh, enough. Ever have a parent say enough? Jesus is saying to the disciples, you don't get it. It's like when he's crossing the Sea of Galilee and Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples look around and say, did we forget our lunch again? And Jesus says, what are you talking about lunch? He said, I'm talking about the teachings of the Pharisees. They were taking a spiritual lesson and making it literal. This is another place where he's taking a spiritual lesson. They said, oh, how many swords? Look, Lord, we got two swords. He's going, enough. How do we know that? Because later when Jesus is being arrested, Peter pulls one of those two swords out to try to defend Jesus. And he's a fisherman. He's not a soldier. He tries to kill the guard and all he can get is his ear. And Jesus says, put away your sword, Peter. Those that take the sword will perish by the sword. If you live by the gun, you'll die by the gun. If you live by violence, you're going to die a violent death. Now, our faith is not in that kind of equipment. He said, put your sword away. Don't you know that I could pray and God will send 12 legions of angels to watch over us? So Christ was not talking about that. He's talking about that we should, uh, we should be armed with the spiritual sword. You're not going to overcome the Roman army with two swords. 2 Corinthians, and this is the verse we just heard. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal weapons, but they are mighty in God, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. God has given us weapons. Now because our trust is not in earthly weapons does not mean there is never a place for earthly weapons. Case in point is King David. David goes out against Goliath. Listen to what he says. 1 Samuel 17, you know the story. Verse 45. David says to the Philistine, to Goliath, You come against me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Now what was David's trust in? He said, Goliath, you're trusting in all your armor and it itemizes his armor. It talks about his javelin. It talks about the greaves on his legs. It talks about his helmet. It talks about his coat of mail, how much it weighed. It goes into great detail to talk about his armor. And David says, you're trusting in that I am coming to you to fight, trusting in the Lord. But here's the question. Did David have a weapon? He did. So this is not to say we trust in the Lord and so then we're reckless. Uh, there might be times where it's a practical thing to do to take precautions. You see what I'm saying? But our trust is not in those things. Our trust is in the Lord. I mean, uh, we're a country. We have freedoms. Should we tell our soldiers to go off into battle and just sing? I know it worked for Jehoshaphat, but they were armed that day too. So I think God wants us to be practical. I hope I'm making sense. Now I want to get into the heart of what I really want to talk about. We are to be armed. God has given us the most important weapon of all. All believers need to be armed with the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This might be a good place for me to get just a visual out here so that... Uh, we got this for a shoot sometime. I got to make the most of it. Use it every time I can. Get a chance. And see if this will stay up here. Not like that it won't. That's a two-edged sword. The Bible is often identified as a two-edged sword. Jesus is pictured coming in, in Revelation 19 with a sword, two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. That is obviously a symbol a uh, sword in his mouth, it's because the word of God was in his mouth. Jesus walking around heaven is not going to have a sword coming out of his head. Uh, Revelation is full of symbols. 
The Bible tells us the word of God, Hebrews chapter 4, is quick and powerful and sharper than any what? Two-edged sword. Why two edges? It's a symbol for the law and the prophets. You've got in Revelation two witnesses, a symbol for the word of God. You might say Lo Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, the new and the Old Testament. Ten commandments are written on what? Two tables of stone. You need the mouth of at least two witnesses for something to be verified. The word of God is the faithful witness of God in that it, uh, it is always true. It's quick and it's powerful sharper than any two-edged sword. Every time Jesus was tempted by the devil and the devil was throwing his fiery arts, his darts at the uh, devil, what did Jesus do to fight that temptation? It is written. It is written. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Our enemy is the devil in sin. Our weapon and protection is the Word of God. If it wasn't for this book, what would we be doing here today? There would be no purpose for meeting. Well, I mean, you can have social gatherings, and there's some churches that do it. They never hear the Bible. But God forbid that should be the case here. Everything we do, everything we believe, the, the guidance, our constitution is the Word of God. It's the sword of the Spirit. It is our most important weapon. You know, I uh, remember Dwight Moody said, sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. You know, we're here just on the outskirts of Sacramento. And this was the destination, the termination for the Pony Express riders between here and St. Louis. And the Pony Express is very big in history. Only lasted three years because soon they had telegraph and railroad. But uh, during the time of the Pony Express riders, they would have these riders that were very light, fit, strong. They're small and wiry, kind of like a jockey. And the reason was weight was extremely important. They'd get the fastest horses. They were at stations 50 miles. Horses would be just about at a gallop for 50 miles. They'd, they'd swap horses and they'd get on another horse and a rider might go, one before they swap riders, he might go 100 miles in a day on horseback. That's got to hurt. They wanted to have, they couldn't carry a gun because they were too heavy. They wore light clothing. They only had half a saddle to keep it light so the horse could run farther. And the postage was like $5 a letter. That's expensive today. That was extremely expensive back then. But there was no other way to get mail to go quickly except the Pony Express. But you want to hear the amazing thing? Every Pony Express rider was given a Bible to carry on every delivery. Isn't that interesting? They knew that they were traveling through dangerous country and they said, I guess they're superstitious. I'll take a Bible with you. <laughs> the, the word was so important to them. It was their weapon. You know, when you talk about the armor of God, of all the different implements of armor, you get the gospel shoes, and you get the helmet of salvation, and you get the belt of truth, and you get the, the shield of faith. And as you're going through the different implements of armor, everything is defensive, except the sword is offensive. It can also be used for defense, but it is something where you can also go forth conquering and to conquer. Jesus said that... Um, uh, in Revelation chapter 13, what is it that brings down the beast's power? Telling those on the earth they should make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword. What was it that brought such damage to the beast's power in the dark ages? It was the Reformation and the Bible. A few amazing facts. First book ever printed on a printing press. German Bible, Gutenberg. In, um, uh, I believe it was 1546, or 1456 rather, sorry. The Bible is the best-selling book of all time. I, just for fun, I googled best-selling book. I said, you know, Harry Potter and Kill a Mockingbird. and had all these other books. I said, you got to be kidding me. And I did a little more research. They don't even list the Bible among the best-selling books because the Bible is the best-selling book in history every year, year after year. There's nothing that even comes close to it. I think I got a chart up there on the screen. You see Bible sales compared to some of the other books? of history, Gone with the Wind, and, and uh, I can't even read all the titles here, Harry Potter and some others, The Da Vinci Code, and those are some books, but when you look at the numbers by the Bible, those books are numbered in hundreds of millions, the Bible is, is sold in billions. Do you realize that um, 50 Bibles are sold every minute? 72,000 Bibles every day 
26 million Bibles are sold a year. The Gideons have given away more than 2 billion Bibles. They used to be able to give them away in schools. Now it's just some of the hotel rooms. Bible is printed at least um, the whole Bible in 95 languages. Part of the Bible in thousands of languages. And uh, I remember one time my father, uh, do you know the Bible is the most sto stolen book? That's partly because some churches have them in the back of their, you know, pews and they're in hotel rooms and so it's the most stolen book in the world. I remember I was visiting my father one day. We're all alone in his house and I said, Doug, come here. I said, what is it? And he pulls his Bible out of this cupboard. He said, the Bible. I said, yeah, Dad, I know. He said, I stole it. <laughs> And I think he thought, you know, some Bible police were going to jump out of the closet or something. <laughs> it was a Gideon Bible. He was going through a real trial in his life and so he needed some guidance and he was returning back to the book his mother read and trying to look for some help. And he was just letting me know, yeah, I know your preacher. He said, I actually have been reading the Bible. And that gave me a little encouragement. But he stole it and I wasn't sure. Can God bless you through a stolen Bible? <laughs> I suppose so. That's a Gideon sort of expect that some of them are going to be taken. Yeah, most stolen book in history. Do you know there's a microfilm packet containing Genesis 1-1 in 16 languages that's on the moon? Back during the days of Apollo, they actually thought that there was some merit in that. They thought if we destroy the world and someone finds the moon has survived, they'll know something about our, our beliefs. The Bible has had more written about it than has been written about the 20 greatest classics of the entire world combined. Combine all of the other classics of history, there's more written about the Bible. Now, I want to give you about six reasons I think the Bible is miraculous. First of all, the Bible is miraculous in its origin. It comes to us by divine inspiration. Uh, the words in this book are not like other words. God has done something where he has supernaturally intervened in providing for us a message, a divine message, and he has protected this message. The Bible tells us, 2 Timothy, of course I'm using the Bible to prove the Bible, but this is what it says. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by the inspiration, the breathing of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It guides us that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible has all that we need and it is divinely inspired. 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, it's a foundation, first things first. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy did not come by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All through the Bible you'll find words like you find in Revelation, where it says, the, to the angel of the church, write. From the beginning where God told Moses to write, and he put those books Job, the five books of Moses, he told to write them down to Revelation, write. He told Mose Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, John, the other apostles, write. God guided them in what they wrote. Now some people are wondering, well did, did God have an angel whispering in their ear and say, write the word the, now I want you to write the word a woman, and then write the word stood, and then, no that's not how it happened. Holy Spirit guided their minds, using their minds and their experience, but the Lord oversaw every word that was given. And I believe the Bible must be taken as a perfect book. Now I realize that you and I are reading Bible translations. And that uh, sometimes some translations are better than the other. But when you go back to original manuscripts, or at least the, the oldest copies that we have, I think that the Lord in the original, he miraculously preserved the Bible and protected it and Here's the danger. You know, people will say, well, Pastor Doug, you know, in 2 Kings, it's words this a little different than it does in Chronicles. Here it says it was 4, and here it says it was 40. Was there a typo? Does that mean the Bible can't be trusted? And here Matthew says there was one blind man, and Mark says there were two blind men that were healed, and which is it? And, and people get hung up on these minor, when you really think about it, they're very minor, very few apparent contradictions. I think there's explanations for all of those that are reasonable. I've looked at all that I can think of and I'm perfectly satisfied with the explanations and I still firmly believe the Bible is a perfect revelation of God. 
if there was something that you could argue, um, you're far better off believing all of it is inspired than starting down that very dangerous road of thinking there could be a mistake here or there and you start deciding what part of it you want to believe. You're much safer believing every word is perfectly inspired. Now there's, you know, study you can do to educate and understand some of the little conundrums in the Bible, but they're very few. The, as a whole, the Bible is such a wonderful, beautiful, concise whole that has been miraculously given to us as an inspired message from God. It's a love letter from God. The Bible is miraculous in its durability. It's outlasted the opposition of its critics and it survives the attempts of its enemies to exterminate it. Several empires have tried to destroy the scriptures. One reason some of the prophecies are given in apocalyptic language in this cryptic images is because John was a prisoner of Rome, Daniel was a prisoner or captive in Babylon when these prophecies were given. Those empires are talked about in their prophecies as falling and to protect those writings God sometimes in his wisdom he gave the visions in code of symbols that we can easily decipher but that's why sometimes he did it that way. There was several um, leaders in the world that tried to ex wipe out the Bible You've got in 303 AD the Roman Emperor Diocletian. He called for the destruction of all the scriptures of the Christians. Now think about that. In 303 Diocletian said he wanted to destroy all the Christian scriptures. You know what that means? The Christians knew what their scriptures were 303. They had a concise book back then. Obviously there must have been a canon, some collection of sacred scriptures. Eusebius, the church father who lived during the time of Diocletian, he wrote we saw with our very eyes the inspired and sacred scriptures committed to the flames in the marketplace in response to the imperial letter ordering the destruction by fire of the scriptures. And at one point Diocletian erected a pillar with the ashes of burnt scriptures and it says we have destroyed the, scripture, the Christian teachings. <laughs> because no one knows about his pillar anymore and the Bible is still here because they had made so many copies he couldn't uh, get rid of them all. It was actually turned out a blessing when you had emperors that tried to destroy the scriptures. What do you think the Jews and the Christians did? They began to furiously copy them and they would hide them. Thus you have the Dead Sea Scrolls where you get thousands of sacred texts that were preserved. Voltaire, the French philosopher and atheist, who was undoubtedly a brilliant man, he made a bold statement one day, 100 years from today the Bible will be a forgotten book. Uh, today most people don't know who Voltaire is. They've forgotten his quote and when he died a uh, hundred years later his home is used as a book depository for Bibles. <laughs> for the French Bible Society uses the home of Voltaire and he said the book would be expired a hundred years. Nobody would remember what it was. And I could go on and talk about Robert Ingersoll and Thomas Paine and atheists who've made these denunciations critiquing the Bible. And you know what? They're all gone and forgotten. But the word of God, heaven and earth will pass away. Jesus said my word will not pass away. Amen. Someone said the Bible is like an anvil that has worn out many hammers. You can spend all your time fighting against the word of God but it's not going to fail. Um, it's one of the only things on the planet that uh, has succeeded and survived through the, the opposition of the enemy. Furthermore, the Bible is uh, miraculous in its results, transforming the lives of those who read it. The Bible is the single greatest source for culture. It's the greatest single source for music, art, architecture, if you were to take the Bible out of the society, you would eliminate most of the art, the songs, the sculptors, the architecture, and the institutions of learning and many hospitals. You don't ever see First Atheist Hospital. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Do you know Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Oxford were established as Christian institutions to promulgate the teaching of the Word of God. You'd never know it today. You get arrested for opening a Bible on some of those campuses. No, it's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. 
But they, they established those institutions of learning because they said, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. They believed that the most important way to teach the youth was the word. The word of God is the beginning of wisdom. For the Bible is miraculous in its harmony. The Bible is comprised of 66 books written by 40 different authors in three languages on three continents over a period of 1500 years and its writers came from every walk of life. They are shepherds, kings, priests, rulers, farmers, fishermen, each with a unique different personality. They wrote from many different situations. Some were in prison, some were in palaces, some were in caves or captive in foreign lands. And yet the content, even though it covers just every subject you can imagine, the content of the Bible, have you thought about it? It's got uh, finance, romance, war, peace, health, poetry, sanitation, music, marriage, law, prophecy, and it speaks on just about every aspect of life, and yet all those different authors and all that different background over all that space of time, it is a concise whole with a singular message. And it's all talking about a central character, one central character, how do you explain this kind of harmony except that it's been divinely guided? George Mueller said the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. If you want to know how your spiritual health is going to be, check your Bible blood pressure. <laughs> Depending on the place the Bible holds in your life, now you know why I'm talking about this. New decade, New year, four days into it, hope it's not too late for you to make a commitment, a resolution to say, I am going to spend time reading the Word of God. It's the fountain of all that we need. The Bible is miraculous in its accuracy. You know, some people say, oh, you can't trust the Bible because, you know, we don't know what the original really said and a few men got together and they changed what everyone said and one person said this and someone changed it and they said this. By the time it gets to us, we have no idea what the original was and who knows if they were inspired and, and I've heard all kinds of crazy, goofy, uninformed, critical things about the Bible. Well, friends, if you don't believe the Bible, you shouldn't believe anything because how would you choose to believe something? You'd say, well, is there evidence? Is there background support? Is there uh, supporting hysterical facts? How many documents do we have that, that form it? There is more information supporting the accuracy of the Bible than any other historical document, period. If you, the arguments people use for not believing the Bible, if they use those arguments, they would not believe Alexander the Great lived. They would not believe that Julius Caesar lived. They would not believe in Plato or Aristotle because we've got infinitely more about the Bible than any of those other characters. And yet people doubt Jesus. Well, there are 5,686 Greek manuscripts. That's the New Testament. The Bible was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Aramaic is sort of a, it's a Syrian Chaldean. It was a Babylonian language. They spent 70 years there and they adopted that. And some things were written in Aramaic and some were written in Hebrew. New Testament is written in Greek. But there are over 5,000 manuscripts. And that's just talking about the, the, uh, the Greek. If you were to add in the documents that they've got in Latin, Coptic, and Aramaic, and Syriac, you've got a total of 24,000 supporting documents for the truth in the Bible. And when you put them all together, you say, well, has it been changed? Can we trust it? Scholars agree that there is 99.5% perfect harmony and the places where you might say there's a little difference, some of it's because you're going from one language to another. How many of you speak more than one language? And you know that sometimes it sounds funny when you try to take something from one language and put it in another. It's like in German. Now, I don't speak German, but I've heard. My father-in-law spoke German. I would say in English, I'm going to go throw some hay over the fence to the cow. In German, I, I'm going to go throw the cow over the fence some hay. Well, that sounds a little different. Uh, Germans don't make sense anyway. So, but uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but as you go from one language to another, that's explaining the 5% of difference. And there, sometimes you use the same word, you can have two or three words that say the same thing. That's that 5%. 0.5, 0.5 uh, thank you. Uh, that's one half of 1% is what I'm talking about. Otherwise, it's perfect. 
in its uh, um, uniformity, in its harmony. The scripture is miraculously protected for its accuracy. And then most importantly, it is miraculous in its message, telling of many occasions when God supernaturally intervened in the affairs of men to accomplish his purpose. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the spirit gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, if you look at a telescope, you're going to see a telescope. If you want to get the most out of a telescope, don't look at a telescope, look through the telescope. Uh, people just look at the Bible, you may not get much out of the Bible. You start reading the Bible, and that's where the greatest proof is. It's miraculous in its message, and you look at what it does to the people that read it. It transforms their lives. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just, I felt this firsthand. Um, I was a, a big zero. And I, my life was so confused, I had no idea where I came from, what I was doing here, where I was going. And well, I kind of know now looking back where I was going. But um, I did it then. And when I started reading the Bible, everything came into focus. And I was able to understand what the purpose of life is, where I came from, what I'm doing here, and where I'm going. The Bible explains the big questions in life. Uh, the worldview that comes from the Bible if people really follow that, people say, oh, Christians start all the wars. No, they're not. Real Christians don't start the wars. They're peacemakers. If people were really practicing the teachings of Jesus, the world would be a wonderful place. A biblical worldview is the only one that really makes sense. By the way, the founding fathers of the United States had a biblical worldview. Even though some of them were deists, they all read the Bible. They all recommended the Bible. Most of them were Christians. And uh, they said, you know, these are the principles that we see God gave Moses for a just government. Most of the laws in the world are based on the Mosaic just, uh, jurisprudence. The difference between first degree murder and manslaughter comes from the books of Moses. And uh, the principles of mercy, and you could just go through the laws of Moses and, and you could understand the principles of law there that govern most of the world right now. Came from the Bible. It's miraculous in its message. Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. Moses said, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. Bind them for a sign on your hand. They will be as frontlets between your eyes. You will teach them to your children. Speaking of them, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you'll write them on the doorposts of your house and in your gates. So in the word of God, it's telling us that it should surround our lives. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, you know, there's so many, there's like a dozen metaphors in the Bible of the Bible, and they're all metaphors of things that are crucial to life. It's like the high priest had this breastplate with these 12 precious gems, and you've got these gems in the Bible that explain the metaphors. The Bible is milk. Baby can't live without it. 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. The Bible is a mirror, shows us the truth, shows us who we really are. James 1.23, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. He observes himself and he forgets what manner of man he was. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's another word for the Bible, the law of liberty, and continues in it, this man will be blessed in what he does. The Bible is like good seed. Jesus said in Luke 8, 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God. It's like, you know, a seed is miraculously, has a light, has life, the, the elements of life in it, and with the water, it comes to life. I hesitate saying this, but the Bible says the Bible is like a hammer. Jeremiah 23, 29, is not my word like a fire? There's another analogy. Says the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Now some of you are going to take that, you're going to run out and use your Bible like a hammer. Uh, I think you've got to do that very carefully. <laughs> but the word of God, sometimes it does break in pieces like that stone that broke the image in Daniel. The Bible is like a light. If you're in a dark place, you appreciate that. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The commandment, Proverbs 6.23, is a lamp and the law is a light. 
Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And Peter says, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which we do well if we take heed. It's like a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. It's not just a little light. It's a light that brightens the whole world. The word of God is bread for the soul. Jeremiah 15, your words were found and I ate them. Your word to me was the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Job 12, 20, uh, 23, 12, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And of course Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word. The Bible's like water. For as the rain, Isaiah 55, 10, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth and brings forth to bud, that it might give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be, like rain that comes from my mouth. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, the church, with the washing of water by the word. The Bible is like living water. The word is like a rock. The Bible says, whoever hears these sayings in mine and does them, he's like the wise man building on the rock. The Bible is like gold and like honeycomb. Psalm 19, Psalm 19 verse 10, his words are more desired than gold, yea, than fine gold, sweeter also than the honey in the honeycomb. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. In the Bible, is like a shield uh, for those who are worried about uh, protection in times of war. Let me give you a little amazing fact. You can read in 2 Samuel 22. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to those who trust in him. I don't know if you've heard about Sam Houston Jr. We all know Sam Houston, big city in Texas named after him. His son was, uh, same name, fighting during the Civil War. He was in the Battle of Shiloh. And uh, during the battle, he was struck in the back by a bullet. And they had big bullets back then, knocked him to the ground. He thought he was dead at first, but then he got up and realized that uh, he escaped and examined the bullet actually had gone into his knapsack and struck the Bible his mother had given him. And it stopped the bullet. And he was curious, so he later opened the Bible and found the bullet stopped on Psalm 70, verse 5, which had been marked by the lead, which reads, O oh God, you are my help and my deliverer. Isn't that nice? That's where the bullet stopped. By the way, that's a picture of it. It's in the Shiloh Military Museum. His Bible, he put the bullet back after he found out where it landed. Now, I'm not suggesting you carry your Bible around as Kevlar. <laughs> Although, you never know. But uh, it is a shield to us. Joshua 1, 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it day and night that you might observe to do it. You know, I could go on and on. Um, some pastors say that and they can't, but I really could. <laughs> Don't test me. Everything we do is about the Bible. Uh, maybe for me, a little more than some of you, but I, I wake up, I read it, I listen when I go to bed, I study it, I preach it, I teach it. Um, we're getting ready to move into our new facilities. It's called the Word Center. World Outreach, Revival, and Discipleship. There is no message that is more important to us than the Bible. And it's just so hard for me to comprehend that there are people who come to church and they don't read their Bibles. Now, I know some of you don't all carry your Bibles because you've got your phones and you've got your Bible in a digital format. And that's okay. Some of you pretend you've got your Bible on your phone. You're looking at Facebook while I'm talking. <laughs> and I know about you. <laughs> we have cameras. <laughs> so, you, you know, sometimes it's more practical to, uh, you know, have your, your digital Bible. Of course, battery never dies on this one, I can tell you right now. <laughs> And when you plug this one in, you want to plug it into heaven, into your heart. But we need to know our Bibles. In the last days, you may be challenged. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you do what you do? And the scriptures tell us we ought to be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. Are you ready to defend your faith? 
Do you spend time in the Word? We ought to be a people saturated in the Word. There are a lot of good Christians in many churches and some of them read the Bible. Uh, some of them know their Bibles pretty well. They may not know the truth that we know, but we ought to know the Bible better than anybody. I was uh, pastoring a small church one time and a former member of the Presbyterian Church joined our church. And the pastor there accused me of sheep stealing. And I said, uh, brother, they're, they're not your sheep and they're not my sheep, they're his sheep. And the sheep go where the grass is. <laughs> and he said, well, how would you like it if I studied the Bible with your members? I said, feel free. And he came back, actually I ran into him at the post office. We all had to stop and I saw him and he told me he had been studying with one of our members. I said, well, how's it going? He said, I'm not getting very far, this is what he said. She knows her Bible too well. <laughs> pastor told me that. I wish that could be said of each one of us. They know their Bible too well. Well, I told you the Bible is like, uh, it's like a mirror, it's like milk, it's like seed, it's like water, it's like bread. But you know most important? The Bible is like Jesus. The message of the Bible is Christ. John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Is it your desire to be like Christ? Where do we find out who He is and what He's like? From cover to cover, this whole book is about Jesus. It reveals who He is. You know, I'd like to just read a, a beautiful quote from, uh, it's actually from Spurgeon, and this is in his devotional called Morning and evening, and it's for June 10, in case you want the reference. He's talking about the words in John 5, 39. It says, these are they that testify of me. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega of the Bible. He is the constant theme of its sacred pages. From the first to the last, they testify of him. At creation, we see him at once one of the sacred trinity. We glimpse him in the promise of the woman's seed. We see Christ typified in the ark of Noah. We walk with Abram as he sees Messiah's day. We dwell in the tents of Isaac and Jacob feeding upon the gracious promise. We hear venerable Israel talking of Shiloh and in the numerous types of the law we find the Redeemer abundantly foreshadowed. Prophets and kings, priests and preachers all look one way. They all stand as the cherub did over the ark desiring to look within and to read the mystery of God's great appropriation. Still, more manifestly in the New Testament, we find our Lord the one pervading subject. It's not an ignorant of gold here or there, a dust of gold thinly scattered, but here you stand upon a solid floor of gold for the whole substance of the New Testament is Jesus Christ crucified. Even the closing sentence is bejeweled with the Redeemer's name. Even so come Lord Jesus. We should always read scripture in this light. We should consider the word to be a mirror in which Christ looks down from heaven and then we looking into it see his face reflected as in a glass darkly it is true but still in such a way to be a blessed preparation for seeing him as we will see him face to face. This volume contains Jesus' letters to us, perfumed with his love. These pages are the garments of our king. They all smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia. Scripture is the royal chariot in which Jesus rides. It is paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. The scriptures are the swaddling bands of the holy child Jesus. Unroll them and you find your savior. The quintessence of the word of God is Christ. That's powerful. It's basically saying everything in this book is telling us about Jesus. A Christian is a follower of Christ. If you want to know who he is, only those that know him will be saved. If you want to know him, we need to spend time in his word. If you want to be nourished, you need to feed on the bread of life, friends. Do you have a devotional life? Are you spending time in the word of God? You know, you're living in an age right now and forgive me for going long. The clock is broken. You can look for yourself. It's not my fault. I just thought God answered my prayer and time stood still so I could keep going. <laughs> but uh, we're living in an age where we are bombarded by media. You are being completely reigned under a blizzard of messages all the time. Everywhere you turn, you can't pump gas without having a commercial hit you. 
No people, no generation in history has ever had their minds, their brains so saturated with media messages. If you and I are going to be reflecting Christ, we need to compensate. It's hard to escape all of it, but you need to at least compensate. And we need to be filling our mind with the Word of God. Have it in your car, have it on your phone, you know how to Bluetooth. Put it in your system at home where you're listening while you're doing things. Listen to Christian radio. Listen to sermons. You can have YouTubes going in the background. But we need to be feeding our souls because I think we're entering the last days. You know, right now, the world's going crazy and demons are filling people and there's violence in the land. The conditions of the world today are like the conditions in the day of Noah where every thought of men's hearts were only evil continually and there was great violence we hear about these shootings and, and these tragedies and I'm looking forward to the day where the scripture will be fulfilled where it says in Micah they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation will not lift up sword against nation neither will they learn war anymore amen right now I'm hoping that you'll make the most of learning about this weapon so you can be protected against the devil's weapons. Amen?